Hi class, this is Sir Alex Basco and welcome to our part 2 of our lesson 2 in General Biology 2. Last time we discussed about transcription, today we are going to discuss about translation. So at the end of the lesson, what I want everyone to be able to do is, uh, first is to be able again to discuss the essential dogma of biology. At the end of this lesson, I hope you understand what the central dogma of biology is, which is basically the gene expression. How we use the information stored in our DNA through the DNA sequence and convert them into RNA and finally create a functional product, a protein, which then expresses those uh, information in our body, creating the phenotypes or the uh, physical characteristics that we see in our body. And lastly, for you guys to be able to process or describe the process of transcription, translation, and protein synthesis. So finally, how proteins are created. So let's have a short review, a quick review of our discussion previously about transcription. So we know that the central dogma of biology basically explains the flow of genetic information. So what that means is we start from DNA and then we create a mRNA, which is a copy of a sequence of the DNA. Uh, that's why we have a process called transcription. And today we are discussing this last part right here, which is translation. This is the central dogma of biology. And to create the final protein for our gene expression, to create this functional product right here, which finally gives us the gene expression or the phenotype or the physical characteristics that is stored in our DNA, there are two processes that needs to happen. First is transcription, which we discussed previously. In transcription, the DNA sequence is basically coded into an mRNA, or an RNA transcript. So we create a copy of that sequence via mRNA. And we copy the template strand. And the mRNA is basically almost identical to the coding strand of the DNA or the strand of the DNA that was not copied. The only thing the difference is that in the coding strand we have T's, but for RNAs we have U's. And if you are a bacteria, which we are not, but if you are a bacteria, this RNA is immediately used as mRNA. mRNA is the RNA that is being used to finally create the protein. But since we are eukaryotes, what we want to do in the transcript or the RNA transcript is to further process it. If you guys remember, in the processing section, we added a 5-end cap and the 3-end poly A tail. At the five, meaning at the five end uh, of our mRNA, we added a cap, and then on the three end tail of our mRNA, or our in our RNA, we added <coughs> a three A or a poly A tail. So it's basically a nucleotide sequence of many A's. Okay. So that is what happened, and this modification is necessary to stabilize our mRNA. The second modification that happens is we cut out the introns. Introns, or basically we splice them. We remove a section of our RNA, or we remove the sections called introns, and the remaining sections called exons are put together to finally create our mature mRNA or messenger RNA. And lastly, or that's basically the transcription. And today we are going to finally discuss what happens to mRNA. RNA. And what happens is basically the last part, which is translation. In translation, this is where we finally create the proteins. Another thing that I want you guys to remember, in transcription, this happens in the nucleus. And this makes sense because in the copying, the DNA is in the nucleus. If you want to copy the DNA, the RNA policy polymerase must exist in the nucleus. The RNA polymerase, if you guys remember, is the enzyme that is responsible in copying the DNA. And then what happens in translation after we created the mRNA, so since we are eukaryotes, remember, we have to process this created transcript, this RNA, this copy. 
And when we modify this, we finally create the mRNA. The mRNA actually exits the nucleus. So in the translation process, I want you to remember this happens in the cytosol. And later I will explain why it happens in the cytosol. And it makes sense that it happens in the cytosol. Okay, so transcription happens in the nucleus of the cell. The translation happens in the cytosol. So basically in the area inside, the uh, inside the cell but outside the nucleus of the cell. So before we finally discuss what translation is, there are some things that I want you to remember in order for you to fully understand what happens during translation. This is something called the genetic code. So the information that is found in the mRNA or the messenger RNA, which comes from the transcript RNA that we modified, so what happens is that we decode the information stored in the mRNA and we decode it using what we call a genetic code. Our, our, our mRNA actually composes of what we call codons. Codons are three letter sequence that is found in mRNA. So we have a picture right here. So this is our mRNA. This is the five end and it has a five end cap. That was added during the modification and then we have at this end we have the three poly a tail so if you look at the mrna again it's basically a sequence of nucleotides but instead of t we have a uracil or u and what happens is that the in order for you to create proteins you have to kind of like separate this sequence into three letters. So this three letter sequence is called codons. So this first three nucleotides is our first codon, uh, which is an AUG codon. So, and then the next three is ACG. This is our second codon. So basically the codon is the three letter sequence that you cut out or you don't cut it out, but you kind of like sequence from our mRNA. So why are these codons necessary? Because the codon actually is the one being read that specifically tells what type of amino acid is, is it coded for. And we use this sequence right here. This is kind of like the Rosetta Stone. If you guys are familiar with Rosetta Stone, Rosetta Stone was discovered like I think I believe in the 80s or 90s that finally were, uh, that we used to finally understand hieroglyphics. Hieroglyphics is the way that Egyptians used to write there are a bunch of pictures and drawings that we initially do not understand. But upon the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, we were able to use the Rosetta Stone as a decoder. So the Rosetta Stone contains the meaning of those drawings. And by understanding the Rosetta Stones, we were able to read hieroglyphics or the writings of the Egyptian. In our uh, in our system, in biology, this is the Rosetta Stone of our mRNA. In order for us to decode what these codons are basically coding for, these codons, again, codes for a very specific amino acids. Because remember, amino acids are the building blocks of your protein. This is what creates the polypeptide chain. By creating a chain of amino acids, you create proteins. So what, in order for us to do that, we have to find the codon and then understand what this codon translates into amino acids. And interestingly, the AUG uh, codes for what we call methionine. Methionine is a type of amino acid. Okay, so this is the Rosetta Stone. So in order for you to read this, for example, let's take ACG. So what you want to do is look at the first letter, which is A. So A meaning you start. So your proteins is along the chose, uh, is along one of these sections right here. And then the next part you have C. So you have to look at C. So C right here. So A and C. So your protein is, uh, should be along this side. But since it only codes for protein, no matter where your third letter is, it will always code for threonine, which is DHR. But for example, let's say you have, let's say one of these. So for example, you have, let's say, AGA. So AGA, remember that, AGA. So your first letter is A, 
So meaning your proteins should be one of these proteins right here, or not proteins, amino acids per se. Uh, Want to clear that up? It's not proteins. It's amino acids. These are amino acids, and we have about 20, 21 amino acids that uh, these uh, three letters code for. So A, G, A. So the, our next letter is G. So we have G right here. So we only know A and G. So A and G can either code for uh, serine, serine or arginine. And then what we need is the last letter, which is A, A, G, A. So looking at the third letter at A, we know that A, G, A codes for arginine. So it codes for the amino acid arginine. So this is how you read our Rosetta Stone, or this is the genetic code. Genetic code is basically the sequence that matches the codon to the amino acids. So again, this is our codon, and each codon, each three letters, uh, codes for a very specific amino acid. Another thing that I want you to remember, these amino acids, again, are put together to create the polypeptide chain. This polypeptide chain is basically a chain of amino acids, which when we finally fold this polypeptide, Yes, remember about your proteins, they need it to fold. If we finally fold this polypeptide, we finally create our proteins. Before we go to our discussion on the process of creating these proteins, let's further discuss the codons. The AUG codon, which is right here, I want you guys to remember this. This AUG codon is specifically called the start codon. This is the start codon that is found on your mRNA is the one signaling the creation of the polypeptide chain, meaning all proteins starts with the start codon, a very specific codon, AUG, which codes for methionine. So when uh, the process the process of creating proteins always starts with the, with the first uh, amino acid, methionine. And in order to finish the production or the creation of the polypeptide, uh, we have to have a stop codon as well. A stop codon is the one that signals the finalization or the creation or the completion of our amino acid chain. So once the process arrives at either UAA, UAG, or UGA, these uh, basically stops the creation of our polypeptide chain. These are the stop codons okay so these are the things that i want you to remember as we later discuss how this polypeptide chain is created i hope that is clear if you guys have any question about this please message me but let's go on the translation another things uh, that i want you to remember before we go to the stages is there are two important molecules in the translation process. The first one is called a transfer RNA. Do not confuse it with a transcript RNA to so mRNA. Okay, so RNA, basically the transcript RNA is the copy that we is the copy RNA that we got from DNA. Transfer RNAs are uh, very specific RNAs which creates the bridge that connects the mRNA to the amino acid. What do I mean by that is that these tRNAs are RNAs uh, that has uh, two ends, okay? The first end has what we call the anticodon. The anticodon is the one that matches your mRNA. Remember, mRNA has codons, and for example, the first codon is the start codon, which is AUG, I believe, yeah, that's AUG, the start codon, and... Um, it matches with the anticodon of the tRNA. And the other end of our tRNA is the one carrying the amino acids. So the tRNA creates the bridge or the connection between the mRNA and the amino acid that it codes for. So it has something like this. So it kind of like actually kind of also interestingly shaped like a T. Okay, that's so why we call them the transfer RNA because it transfers the amino acids and it combines it to our mRNA. This is your mRNA here at the bottom. And this top right here are the tRNAs. So the tRNAs match itself. It's, this is its anticodon right here. And it matches, yeah, this is the anticodon. And this anticodon matches onto the codon of your 
mRNA and then uh, this tRNA contains the amino acids that codes for that specific codon. So this is AGU right here and it codes for a very specific amino acid and we know which uh, amino acid it is because of the tRNAs. So just think of the tRNAs as the one carrying the amino acids, okay? And the second important key molecule in translation process are ribosomes. You guys remember what ribosomes are? We discussed them in lesson, I believe, lesson one or lesson two a long time ago. Ribosomes are found where? They're found abundantly in the cytosol. More specifically, you find them in the endoplasmic reticulum. Remember your endoplasmic reticulum, it has a smooth and it has rough. And our rough endoplasmic reticulum contains a lot of ribosomes. So if you view it in the microscope, you would see a lot of bumps and it looks rough. And all of those bumps are the ribosomes attached on their endoplasmic reticulum. And interestingly, the endoplasmic reticulum is actually connected to your nucleus, to the, um, what's the word here? Uh, to the outside covering of the nucleus. So the plasma membrane of the nucleus. So there's basically two membranes. You have the plasma membrane outside which creates the cell and then there's another membrane inside which creates the nucleus. And the membrane that creates the nucleus is continuous with the endoplasmic reticulum. So you can see the relationship there. After creating your mRNA in the nucleus, the mRNA exits and immediately is found by the ribosomes in order to code for the um, proteins. So the proteins are important key molecules that is found or there a lot of them are found in the cytosol. So the translation process happens in the cytosol. So the ribosomes are the structure that is important in finally building the proteins. And there are two subunits that I want you to remember, the large ribosomal unit and the small ribosomal unit. Or you can just call them the large and the small, or the large ribosome and the small ribosomes. Uh, these units, uh, spe specifically the large ribosome, contain slots called the A, B, and E sites. And this is the site where the tRNAs could find their matching Codon. So these tRNAs right here basically find the matching codon via these slots, the A, B, and E. So later I will show you how this whole process happens. And lastly, important thing that the ribosome does, it's the one catalyzing the linking of amino acids. So all of these tRNAs uh, basically carry only one amino acid, but what we want is a chain. So meaning we want to link all of these amino acids on top right here, but unfortunately you cannot see it when it moves. So all of these amino acids that were on top, we finally link them together to create a amino acids and that's the job of the ribosomes. So it's something like this. So you have the large ribosomal unit here and the large ribosomal unit contains the E, and a site and it has the small ribosomal unit here and the tRNA basically finds its matching this is its anticodon to, it, to the codon or to the matching codon of your mRNA so this tRNA here uh, carrying the trip uh, to, I believe this is tryptophan or uh, triophene and it matches the anticodon matches to the codon of your mRNA and then the ribosomes basically link the methionine to the, uh, the next amino acids. So that is the whole work of the ribosomes. So the tRNAs are the one carrying the amino acids and the ribosomes is creating these sites uh, where the tRNAs can match themselves onto the codon and also create our chain. So let's go to the stages of translation. You may find these uh, words in the stages of translation very familiar because they are the same words we use in transcription. There's initiation, elongation, and termination. It's the same word that we use when we discuss transcription. You have the initiation, 
elongation and terminations. So it's the same stages, same name of stages, but different things are happening. One is happening during transcription where we are copying the DNA, and the other is happening during translation where, where we are finally creating the protein. So let's start with the first, initiation. During the initiation process, we are creating what we call the initiation complex. In the initiation complex, we are, uh, we are putting back or we are assembling. We are putting together the tRNAs and the two ribosomal units. So when we uh, put the tRNAs and the ribosomal units together and the mRNA, we finally create the initiation complex. How does this happen? So the first part is the tRNA, which is carrying your methionine. Methionine uh, is the amino acid coded by the codon AUG. AUG and AUG codon is your start codon. So the whole process of initiation always starts with the tRNA that carries methionine. So the tRNA and the small ribosomal unit connects together. Okay, so the tRNA and the first ribosomal unit, the small ribosome, connects together. And what they do, these tRNA and the small ribosomal units bind themselves to the five end of your mRNA. And they do that by uh, finding the five end cap. Remember when we modified your mRNA, your mRNA will now contain a five end cap. So the tRNA and the small ribosomes will find that 5 end cup and use that as a signal to connect to your mRNA. So now the second part right, of our initiation, we have together the tRNA, the small ribosome, and they are connected to our uh, mRNA via the 5 end cap. The next part is the tRNA and the ribosomal units kind of like walk along the line of your mRNA until they finally arrive at the start codon okay so that's what happens so after connected to the 5 end cap they will move the tRNA and the ribosome will move along the codons of your mRNA until they arrive at the start codon when the start codon was found by the tRNA and the ribosomal and the small ribosomes the large ribosome will finally join to finally create the initiation complex. So this is the whole process of initiation, initiation to create the initiation complex. Now the uh, four important parts are all connected. You have your tRNAs carrying the methionine. You also have the small ribosomal unit. You have your mRNA and you have your large ribosomes. So that's the initiation complex. So when, whole, when all of these process happens, we are going to our next part of our stage called the elongation. So during the elongation process from the word itself, we are now creating and we are making the amino acid chain. Okay, so how does this happen? So the, during the elongation, again, it, this is where uh, our amino acid chain gets longer. So the methionine carrying tRNA starts at the P site the p sites remember there are three sites you have the e you have the p and then you have the a so the tRNA starts at the p site which is the middle site of your large ribosomal unit and what happens is at the eight site which is the next open area uh, there is a codon exposed there's a codon of mRNA exposed at that a site and a new tRNA will land on that A site uh, by connecting its anticodon to the codon of your mRNA. And the codon that is found in your mRNA specifically codes for a very specific amino acid. And that amino acid is carried by our second tRNA. And this uh, second amino acid carrying tRNA binds to the codon of the uh, mRNA found on the A site. So you have your E, you have your P, you have your A. On the P site, you have your methionine carrying tRNA. On the A site, the next uh, open site, this is where the next tRNA uh, lands uh, to match itself on the mRNA. And that's what happens. Next is that the ribosome catalyzes the polypeptide bond. 
So the methionine, which is the amino acid found on your first tRNA, moves and connects itself to the next amino acid found by your second tRNA. So uh, the ribosome, that's the job of the ribosome, it catalyzes the polypeptide bond. So by moving the methionine and transferring it to the next amino acid. So now after doing this, the tRNA, the first tRNA is now empty. It doesn't have the methionine anymore because the methionine is connected to the amino acid of our second tRNA. So after doing this, what happens is that the mRNA, comp the mRNA is pulled. So basically, the whole initiation complex moves. So the first tRNA moves to E site. So you have your E, you have your P, you have your A. So the first tRNA was originally in the P, but after transferring its methionine, it will move to E, e site. E site is much easier to remember because you can think of it as the exit site. So when the first tRNA moves from E to E, it will finally exit the whole complex. So the second tRNA that was originally on the A site will move on to the P site. So on the P site, you have your tRNA containing the methionine and the second amino acid. So the, as you can see, you're basically back to the first one. But instead of a methionine carrying tRNA, you have the methionine, and then you have the next amino acids, and then you have the tRNA. And the A site is finally open for the next tRNA to land. And the next and the third tRNA contains another amino acid, and the whole process repeats. So that's the whole elongation process of the translation. And lastly, to finally end the creation of the chain, it's called the termination. Once a stop codon, you remember this is stop codon, the UAA, UAG, and the UGA, when, when this enters the, I believe, the A site, as soon as the A site um, reads, or the A site reads uh, the uh, stop codon, uh, a tRNA will attach to the stop codon and the whole process is stopped. So the initiation complex uh, disassembles. So the tRNA, the small uh, ribosomal units and the large ribosomal units are dismantled. So they pull away from each other. So that's the job of the stop codon. It triggers uh, the dismantling of the initiation complex. It removes the mRNA and it also removes the polypeptide chain that is created. So how many times does this happen? So it depends on the protein that you want to create. The, lo the longest protein chain that we know is actually 33,000 amino acids. So remember that we have to create or the, in the whole translation process happens for a very, very long time. <clears throat> uh, because you see it's 3,000 or 33,000 amino acids. So it depends on what protein you are creating. But that's the longest that we know. Okay. Another thing that you may ask, um, does this happen? How many times do we use the mRNA? We use the mRNA multiple times. And this translation process does not happen uh, kind of like once every time. You, once uh, you are past the start codon, while, the, while there's a translation happening on that mRNA, another ribosomal units can attach onto that mRNA. So you can have two translation process happening on a single mRNA. So that's the whole process of translation. So if you're going to view it with some moving pictures, so it's something like this. So you have your, uh, and this is not a perfect scenario, but please think of it. So this is your first tRNA, and what happens is it connects first on your small ribosomal units, and then they connect onto the five end of your mRNA. And then they move and find the, uh, the start codon, and once they do that, those large ribosomal units will attach. So that's the whole initiation process. And the next part is the elongation process is basically something like this. So you have your a, uh, you have your transfer RNA originally at the P site. And then what happens is, can you see that? So it moves on to the next. So it takes 
uh, the methionine or you can not methionine specifically but the amino acid from your first tRNA and the ribos large ribosomal unit catalyzes is and attach it to the next tRNA. So this is basically what is happening. And then after this becomes empty, it moves from P site to E site. In the E site, it exits. And the A site it is finally free, which another tRNA can attach, matching the anticodon of your tRNA to the codon of your mRNA. And then when that happens, the, <coughs> the ribosomal unit attaches the uh, amino acid on the tRNA of your the tRNA found in the P site and moves the amino acid chain onto the tRNA found on the A site. And when this is empty, it moves to the E site and the whole process just continues. So this is the whole process. So this whole process is stops when the stop codon, <clears throat> when the stop codons finally arrives the A site, this whole process dismantles and we finally have the polypeptide chain. So what happens next, we're not yet finished because the protein that is created, this chain right here, this is kind of still short, but this be this can become really, really long. This whole chain right here is not yet done. After creating the chain of the, poly the polypeptide chain, after the termination, the polypeptide chain is still has to fold. Do you remember our discussion on proteins? In our discussion of proteins, proteins or which is basically a chain of amino acid in order for them to function they have to fold themselves into a 3d shape this is called the tertiary structure and this 3d shape is necessary otherwise our protein will not function another way that they have to do is um, they can combine themselves with another polypeptide chain or into another 3d shape creating uh, two polypeptide chains that are connected together we find we're in we are creating the quaternary structure so this is an example you have your polypeptide chains and then you have your secondary which is the uh, primary structure just the chain you have your secondary structure you have your alpha helix and alpha beta, uh, beta sheets and then in the third structure the last part the 3d is uh, the 3d structure is ma uh, creating the 3D structure so the polypeptide chain still has to fold. When it folded, it can finally function the protein and when that protein is finally able to function, it will finally express what uh, the information found in the DNA is. So it can influence the color of your skin, the shape of your eyes, uh, it could be uh, is your hair curly, is your hair straight, is your hair brown or dark, are your eyes dark? So the proteins are the one expressing those phenotypes. So that is the whole process of translation. And that is the ending of translation and transcription. And if you guys have any question, again, do not hesitate to message me. May you guys have a great day and thank you so much.